Hey everybody, Dr. Phil here. So this is going to be a video on inventory. So the first thing we'll talk about in this video is determining inventory items. So merchandise inventory includes all goods that a company owns and holds for sale, regardless of whether the goods are located and when the inventory is counted. Okay. So items requiring special attention include goods in transit, uh, goods on consignment. We'll talk about that later in the video and goods damaged or obsolete. So let's, uh, let's jump into into that. So the first thing we'll talk about is goods in transit. So there's two terms. I did a, an, another video on this, uh, FOB shipping point and FOB destination. So FOB shipping point is when the goods are included in the buyer's inventory when shipped, and FOB destination is the goods are included <coughs> excuse me, in buyer's inventory after arrival at the destination. So you kind of think of this as, you know, when does when the title of the goods change hands? So goods on consignment. So you may have heard of consignment stores. Um, so the consignor is the owner of the goods. So think of that as the person that goes into the consignment store and says, hey, I got some stuff I want to sell. Can you try to sell it for me? The consignee sells the goods for the owner. So that's the shop itself, in essence. Um, merchandise is included in the inventory of the consignor, so not the shop. When you walk into a consignment store, that's not their inventory, they don't own it, so they're not listing it on their books. And as it says, consignee never reports consigned goods in inventory. So what about damaged or obsolete goods? So damaged or obsolete goods, <clears throat> well, they're not going to be reported in inventory if they can't be sold. Kind of makes sense, right? Damaged or obsolete goods which can be sold are included in inventory at net realizable value which is just simply the sales price minus the selling cost um, and any loss would be recorded when damage or obsolescence occurs all right determining inventory costs so this is where you got to be careful because it's not just the cost of the inventory itself it's all these ancillary costs you can include too so examples um certainly all the expenditures necessary to bring an item to a saleable condition just means you can sell it basically and location. Um, so the inventory cost is going to be the invoice cost minus any discounts and plus any other costs. So examples of other costs, and this is not an exhaustive list, like shipping, storage, insurance, import duties, anything ancillary that you had to pay on top of the inventory itself. Okay, internal controls and taking a physical count. So most companies take a physical count of inventory at least once each year. And this, this count is used to adjust the inventory account balance to the actual inventory available. So you would think they'd be the same. There's usually some discrepancies. So they have to, they have to correct that. So good internal controls over the inventory account. These would include number one, pre-numbered inventory tickets in the same way that people have pre-numbered checks. It's going to help you keep up with it. Number two, counters have no inventory responsibility. So think about separation of duties. Um, number three, Counters confirm the existence, the amounts, and the condition of inventory. Number four, second count is taken by a different counter, and they and they, they don't compare notes, keep them separate. And then number five, the manager confirms all items counted only once. So different inventory costing methods. There's really four main methods. This is specific identification, first in, first out, which we call FIFO, last in, first out, which we call LIFO, and then number four is what we call weighted average. So those are like the four main types of inventory counting. So here, here you can see three of them side by side. We've got FIFO. So if FIFO, costs flow in the order incurred, right? So $70 was spent on May the 6th, um, 65 on May the 3rd, 45 on May the 1st. So you can see here, um, the goods that would be considered sold, um, would be in this case May the first because that's the like the first units in, so they're the first ones considered to be sold. It doesn't in the physical it doesn't really matter which ones you pick. This is just for the accounting and the inventory costing piece. So again, first in was May the first, so that one was, would be the one that would be considered to be sold. So you can see they've listed that one for cost of goods sold. Now uh, the last in first out, it's it's the exact opposite. So if you notice the cost of goods sold, they now picked they didn't pick the first one right, they picked the last one. This one that came in on May 6th. So now the cost of goods, goods sold is going to be considered to be 70. So you can already see there's potential to, um, you know, to 
switch between these methods. There are rules against that, by the way, in case you're wondering, but there are ways that the companies can manipulate this to adjust their cost of goods sold and subsequent net income. So for weighted average, um, what they would do here is they, if you just add all three of these up, you get the 180 divided by three is gonna give you the 60. So the cost of goods sold will just be, it's, they sold one, just 60 bucks. So the cost flow of inventory, this is something that I would, if I was you, I'd maybe pause, make sure you understand these. Um, it's, it's, it's honestly something you already know, it's just sometimes the way these books present the terminology. But beginning inventory, what you brought over from last period, plus net purchases, just what you purchased this period, is gonna give you merchandise available to sale this period. And then two things can happen to your inventory, right? You either sell it, if you sell it, it goes to cost of goods sold. If you don't, it just stays in ending inventory. All right, inventory costing under a perpetual system. So there's inventory effects on the balance sheet because if you don't sell it during, you know, at the end of the period, it's still your inventory. So it's, you don't want to keep it, but it's still yours for now. So that's listed on your balance sheet, your asset ending inventory. For the income statement, uh, cost of goods sold. Um, again, that's reporting. Income statement reports revenues and expenses. So you're gonna list cost of goods sold on the income statement. And as it says, very important, physical flow does not need to follow the cost flow. So just because you're using, say, FIFO for your accounting records, you might be using LIFO in real life. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's totally okay. So as an inventory costing illustration using perpetual system, um, so we've got some information here about the mountain bike inventory of trekking for the month of August. So you can see August 1, beginning inventory, and you can see how these have been broken up. We call these layers, by the way, inventory layers. And a layer is denoted by the unit cost. So like I could say, I've got a $91 layer, I've got a $106 layer, I've got a $115 layer, and I've got a $119 layer. So these, again, these are layers based on what you purchased inventory for. So beginning inventory, August 1, they had 10, 10 units, probably 10 bikes at 91. Um, August 3rd, they bought 15 more. The price has gone up. We can look at this and say this is a period of inflation, right? Because the costs are going up. They purchased more on 20, uh, 20 units on August 17th. The costs have gone up to 115. And then August 28th, 10 more at 119. Now remember, this is what they paid. This isn't what they're charging their customers. This is just what they paid. So like when you see these two sales, August 14th, August 30th, 130, 150, that's what they're charging other people. Um, and then over here, we just kind of have a running balance of the inventory. So if we're looking at, if we were to do specific identification, um, then again, we've got 10 at 91. We go back, you can see the 10 at 91 beginning inventory is 910. August 3rd purchase, that there's 15 bikes they bought. We've now got 1590. We've got these two separate layers. August 17th, they purchased 20 at 115 for an amount of 2300. Um, so you can you can see um, on August seventeenth where they also made they made these sales right ten at ninety one fifteen at one hundred six and then you can just see how they're they're just basically netting these against each other right so like August seventeenth they had twenty at one fifteen they sold fifteen at one fifteen um, so they got obviously five left over at one fifteen um, and then at the very bottom here this is this is in essence what they got left right ten at one nineteen still available still sitting in the inventory. Um, They've got, they sold three at 119, so then they've got seven left at 119. So fairly, fairly straightforward. So for first in, first out, oldest costs are the cost of goods sold. The recent costs are gonna represent your ending inventory. So if we're looking at first in, first out, remember it's like the units that were first purchased are gonna be the ones that they consider that they have sold. So everything you see on goods purchased, like the 15 at 106, 20 at 115, 10 at one, those are all gonna be the same whichever method you use, it's just gonna be, the question is how does it affect your cost of goods sold? So again, if they, if they sold on August 14th, then 10 at 91, this this represents what? This, this represents the beginning balance that they had, right? That, that first layer, those were the first ones in, those will be the first ones out. So those are gonna be sold, and then we've got 10 at 106. So um, you can see that they took, of the 15 um, of the second layer they had, the 106 layer, They've sold 10 of those, they've got five now left, okay? Um, August 17th, they purchased more at 115. August 28th, they purchased more at 119. And then on August 30th, they sold, if you add the five and the 18, we know they sold 23. So the first thing they're gonna do is get rid of this, um, the 106 layer that they had left, 
they, remember they had five of these 106s left. Get rid of those. And then they're going to sell 18 of, they've got 20 sitting in this next layer, the 115. They're going to sell 18 of those. So there'd be two 115s left, which you see over here. And then they didn't touch this very last layer that they got, um, the August 28th layer at 119. They didn't touch any of those. So again, just think of it like this. Every time you make a sale, you start with the oldest layer you've got, get rid of those, and just keep working your way down. The last in first out, it's the exact opposite. So recent costs, cost of goods sold, oldest costs are going to go in ending inventory. So for this one, again, it's everything you see in goods purchase is the same. Now what they're doing is if you look at the cost of goods sold, and if you want to just go back and look at the FIFO part of the video, that's fine. It's probably going to help you. They just It's the other way around. Instead of starting at the top, working their way down, they're taking the most recent inventory layer. In this case, there's 106. And they got rid of that. And then they said, okay, we've still got 10 at 91, but we need five of those. So we've got five at the $91 layer. And then the two purchases are the same. And then for August 30th, they said, okay, we're going to sell 23 units, right? So we're going to take these most recent ones first. Again, last in the August 10th, excuse me, August 28th, the 119 layer is the last one in. Get rid of those first. And then we're going to take 13 of this 115 layer here of the 20 we had. So we should have seven of those left. If we look down here, you can see it. Yep, we've still got five at 91, that very top layer. And we've got seven at 115. So the weighted average for perpetual, um, fairly straightforward. When a unit is sold, the average cost of each unit in inventory is assigned to cost of goods sold. So it's just simply cost of goods available for sale divided by the number of units you got. So as you can see here, on August 14th, 20 bytes are sold. So in order to determine the cost of the unit sold, we first have to compute the weighted average cost per unit of items in inventory. So the cost of goods available for sale is that you can see the 2,500 here divided by the 25 units they had. So the weighted average cost per unit is, is just simply 100. So the cost of goods sold for the August 14th sale is going to be 2,000. And then after the sale, there are five $100 units in inventory um, totaling 500. You can see them at the you can see them at the bottom here. Um, let me make sure we advance there. Yeah, good. So for August 17th, the cost of goods available for sale is 28. You can see it right here. Look at the very bottom of this little graph, graphic, excuse me. Units available at time of sale was 5 plus 20. So now we're just going to divide it by 25. So we have a weighted average cost per unit of 112. So after the August 14th sale, there are five units in inventory totaling 500. On August 17th, 20 units were purchased for 2,300. Um, so we're just going to take the 2,300 um, of the most recently purchased units, add the 500 from the layer before. So we got, and then just divided by 25. So we now have an updated um, cost of 2,800. We've got 25 units. So we have an updated cost per unit of 112. So just think of it like this. Every time you purchase more units, you've got to redo that cost. August 28th, cost of goods available sale of $39.90. You can see at the very bottom here, $39.90, divided by the units available at time of sale. We had five, we got 20, and we've we got 10. So divided by 35. So now the weighted average cost per unit has just inched up a little bit from, what was it before, 112. Now it's 114. So after the 28th, August 28th purchase, um, there are five plus 20 plus 10. So we have 35 units in inventory, and we have 2,800 plus the 1,190 that they just spent. So for a total of 39,90, and then just divide that by the updated number of units they now have on hand, which is 35, and we'll get that 114 per unit. Um, and then of course, as always, you know the cost of goods sold is going to be different. In this case, weighted average cost of goods sold for the August 30th sale is going to be the 26,22. And the ending cost of um, inventory, we've got 12 units left, and we have an average cost of 114 each. Or if you want to multiply those together, you would get the 1368 that I put in red here. All right, so financial statement effects of the costing methods. So if it's first in, first out, the ending inventory approximates is going to be about the current cost because you're selling the units that you most recently purchased. Um, if it's last in, first out, then the cost of goods sold on income statement approximates its current costs. And if we look at the weighted average method, this smooths out the price changes. So of course, as you if you buy units that are more expensive, then 
obviously the, the average is going to keep being um, skewed upwards. Okay, so here you see um, the kind of if you look at the specific identification versus FIFO versus LIFO versus weighted average, you can kind of see the differences in cost of goods sold. Now are they massively different, no, but you notice that they are different. And of course, this has bearings on cost of goods sold has bearings on net income, and of course. The earning inventory has balance sheet implications with respect to valuation. Okay, next thing, lower of cost or market. So inventory must be reported at the market value if market is lower than cost. So this is something in accounting we, we, we speak about conservatism. So uh, market is defined as the current replacement cost, not the sales price. Consistent with, as I was saying, the conservatism principle. Um, and there's three ways you can apply this. Um, you can do it separately to each individual item, which obviously most companies are not going to do. It's going to be too laborious and, you know, time consuming. Um, number two, to major categories of assets. Or number three, to the whole inventory, which number two and number three are much more, much more likely. So as an example, so it says a motorsport retailer has the following items in inventory. So we've got these roadsters, they got 20 of those, they got 10 of these sprints. All right, and they're looking at the total cost like for the roadsters 170 total market is 140 so they're just it's just a case of saying which one's lower okay 140 we'll go with that think about the name lower of cost or market for the sprints it's 50 versus 60 so we'll go with a 50 so therefore they have a 190 um sort of inventory cost if you will now what they are going to do is they're going to have to write down um the inventory Right, based on the uh, based on think about this thirty thousand dollar difference for the roadsters, one seventy versus one forty. So what we'll do is we'll increase, or I should say, we they will increase cost of goods sold by thirty, and they will um, credit merchandise inventory also for thirty. So basically, it doesn't mean they sold they haven't sold anything here. They're just recognizing that yeah they paid one seventy for it, but it's only worth one forty. So they're sort of they've kind of taken a bath on that thirty thousand dollar difference, if you will. All right, income statement effects of inventory errors. So when the inven when ending inventory is understated, then the presumption is that cost of goods sold is overstated because remember it's it's one or two places you either sold it or you didn't. Um, if ending inventory, excuse me, if cost of goods sold is overstated, then obviously there's an inverse relationship with net income, and that is understated. Um, and then what will happen in year two is that will just reverse itself. If ending inventory is overstated then cost of goods sold presumably is understated. So you're basically saying that you've got more in ending inventory than you do. So the presumption is you sold less, hence the understatement of cost of goods sold. And then of course, the inverse relationship with, um, as a corollary to uh, for net income is overstated. And again, those differences reverse themselves in year two. <clears throat> so financial statement effects of inventory er errors with respect to balance sheet effects. So if ending inventory is understated, then assets, because obviously inventory is an asset, um, is understated, and equity is also understated, and the opposite if inventory is overstated. <clears throat> All right, inventory turnover. So this is a ratio. Remember what I always say: if you hit, if you're getting towards a ratio, then good news. You're probably pretty much at the end of the chapter. So good news. So this is inventory turnover. Think about like how quickly they're turning over the inventory. So this shows how many times a company turns over its basically sells its inventory during a period. This is an indicator of how well management is controlling the amount of inventory available. So inventory turnover is just simply cost of goods sold and then divided by average inventory. So the way we would get our average inventory, we'd take the balance sheet amount at the beginning of the period, we would take it at the end, and we would just smooth it out. So as it says, average inventory, beginning plus ending inventory, divided by two. The other one we can do as, as, as a sort of a corollary to that is day sales and inventory. Um, this one reveals how much inventory is available in terms of the number of days of sales. So this one is just ending inventory divided by cost of goods sold and then multiplied by three. So there's other ways you can calculate this one, but this, this way is fine. So if we look at uh, Costco and we look at Walmart, um, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see some of the numbers here, like inventory turnover, right, 11.8, 11.9, two years ago, so it's not really changing too much. Day sales, day sales and inventory, one thing I'll say about this just real quick, 
Um, and we are at the end, I promise. We, I know I say that like 10 times every video, but we, we really are. Is inventory turnover and day sales, it's telling you the same thing. It's just expressing it two different ways. If you're sitting in a meeting, you could say inventory turnover is 11.8 times. Probably the accounting people and the finance people will understand that. The, the other people may not. Whereas if you say, well, day sales and inventory is 31.3 days, basically it takes about 31.3 days to cycle the inventory, then, then people are much more likely going to understand that. So just understand these two, the 11.8 and the 31.3, you're saying the same thing, you're just saying it in a different way. Okay. All right. As always, thank you for watching and I will see you all soon.